second and last class for this course. Uh, the one last thing that's optional for this group, it was uh, intended to be mandatory, but I recognize with the uh, class, three classes being cancelled, and we didn't cover this material until uh, we finished responsive to the uh, last class. So, unfortunately, I'm a little bit behind in terms of where we would normally be for this course due to things like snow days and Easter. And this coordination with the Friday classes has cut up three Friday classes. So this project then now is optional. It's not mandatory, but it's highly recommended because it brings together so many parts of the course that it actually will be an effective method for studying the course in three or six or three. So if you do the project and you get full grade for it, you'll get an additional 5% bonus on your course grade. Uh, so you can use that as a boost for yourself, or just simply just to study for the for the exam. So what it is is it's a it's a system is described here in the write-up. So the company is working on a process where you actually know very little about it. Uh, so there, there is some information here, but you've got three variables that you're experimenting with: the flow rate of raw material into the reactor. Then the reactor gets discharged into a, a separated unit, a, a liquid liquid extractor where you can recycle the solvent. So that's the second variable that you can manipulate is the solvent flow rate. And the third variable under manipulation is the impeller type that's used in that liquid liquid extraction step. So you can do these experiments. There's the three hours between experiments. So when you log into the course website, um, you will then have a screen that looks something as follows. It's web-based, so you enter in what the material flow rate is in kilograms per minute, your recycle flow rate in meters per minute, you pick your type of impeller, either Z or Q, and then you run your experiments. So here's some experiments that I ran at different flow rates, different recycle flow rates, and different impeller type, and it will return in the profits for you. You wait three, four hours, you can sign back in again, and you can run your next experiment. They will show you what your, your, uh, where your points are run. These are the constrained bounds for you. Yeah, I just ran three points right on top of each other, so it's not so exciting over here. But um, what, what you will notice is that every group getting will have a different baseline. Your location and baseline will be different. Um, your levels returned by the software will be different. Your different profitability. So every group is actually optimizing a different system. So please, if you want to share your data with other group members, uh, it's not going to be too helpful for you. You're, uh, it's pretty much an individual project or individual group based project. So there's 26 runs that you can do. So that means if you do eight experiments a day, the fastest you can solve this project if you're staying out 24 hours a day is three, four days. But that's not the intention. The intention is that you've got until the 23rd of April to solve this system. So just before the final exam is when you've got a chance to start. Um, so if you want to work backwards from that day, that's fine. However, I recommend you start today and do one or two experiments every day and climb this response surface and can get to the maximum. So, any questions on that? Um, a lot of students in previous years in this course have found this to be one of the more interesting parts of any course they've taken at the university. But it is a fairly realistic approximation of what you will be doing uh, one day if you implement this one. So I, I highly recommend you give it a go. Um, you can work up into two groups of three, I think it is. Um, so email me your group members' names. Uh, 600 level students, you can work in groups of two. 400 level students in groups of three. Um, and, and go for it from that. Okay, let's, uh, let's just wrap up the section on design experiments with the uh, two last topics. Um, one is that of when you're optimizing your system, DOEs. This is not just for response service methods, but this is for design experiments in general. Many of you have course projects where you you are asking, well, Kevin, I've got three Y variables. Uh, so for those of you doing cooking experiments, you often measure the height or the width of something, and then you also measure taste. Well, what is the Y variable that you pick? We have the same problem in industry when you're optimizing the system. You might find that minimizing cost is certainly one of your objectives, but another objective might be to maximize yield. So you've got these two opposing variables. Not often opposing, but they don't necessarily coincide on the same optimal operating point. So here you can see in solid lines are the curves for yield and Sorry, the curves for minimum cost, and then the dashed lines of the curve for yield. 
So in this particular case, they're not too far apart. If I to or minimize cost, that would be my optimum. If I had to maximize yield, that would be my optimum. So I can find a middle ground somewhere in between that and operate at that point. Another way to try and rephrase this problem, as I've mentioned in previous classes, well, rather than instead of trying to trade off two types of Y variables, recast it as a single Y variable, and usually the most relevant one is net profit. So net profit would adequately take into account minimizing the costs here in this case, as well as maximizing the yield. I can maximize the yield and, and simultaneously minimize the cost. I'm likely going to be able to recast that problem then as maximizing y as equal to profit. So in most cases, profit, whether it's something like dollars per hour or dollars per kilogram of raw material or dollars per on some basis, usually this is a great objective function to make your wider when you've got competing markets that you have to achieve. Okay, so that's pretty much all I'll say on it. The other point to make on multiple Y's is that there's no reason why you cannot simply repeat your analysis for both Y variables simultaneously. So do your DOE for total cost, do your DOE for, um, for, for yield here in this case, and analyze the effect of A, B, C for each one. So you simply just repeat all the work you've done for each Y variable. And that also gives you some great understanding of, of the system. The next topic to talk about, and maybe what I should do is I'll, I'll come back into evolutionary operation. Let me just skip ahead here to this slide, to the general approach for experiments, and then I'll come back to evolutionary optimum here. It's actually phase four, so we'll talk about the phase four. So George Box, who, who initiated a lot of um, topics on experimentation and specifically factorial designs, had a number of famous quotations that he's known for. And since he's died, died last week, um, a lot of this has been in sort of scientific blogs and so forth, but people have been re remembering these sorts of things that he's been saying. But one of the things he's most famous for is the best time to run an experiment is after the experiment. And, and I guess after you're doing your DOE project, many of you can understand where that where your boy is going with that. It's because you've spent your time and effort doing it, and then you realize after that first experiment how little you actually know and how much you would have changed your setup and how much differently you would have done something. Right? So you've never realized that before you actually did the first experiment. So the best time to run your experiment is after that first two or three experiments and you actually know where you should be going. The other problem is that people often are reluctant to do any experiments. I had some strong views on that at the start of this section of the course that I'd said in class here. And I agree with uh, what George Box said. He said you have to play with the system or interfere with it to learn more about it. And you can't just sit in, sit in meetings in your office and you will see this. When you start working, people will have hourly, hour, hour long meetings going on and on about what they think about the process. I think this. If we change temperature, we expect that. Then they just never get off their butts and actually go do it. Well, just do it. Right? Go, go do the experiment and learn about your system. Because what you will likely find is that it's something unexpected about it. Some of your variables will be expected, but a few of your variables should sometimes surprise you. And then the, the final one is this on budgeting and time. Well, do not spend a lot of your budget up front. Do a very, very crude screening design, so a very, very heavy fractionated factorial, so a resolution three factorial, for example, we can find main effect of two factor interactions. Spend about 20% of your budget on that preliminary design. That's going to give you a good focus for which variables really are important. Then you can go ahead and do some more higher resolution designs. So move up to a resolution four or a resolution five design in history where you've got to spend the rest of your budget. But those 20% of your budget, 25% of your budget, should really just be for that initial screening design to find what is important and what's not. Then we said, we spent a few classes here looking at response service methods. How do we climb that mountain towards an optimum? Okay, so what we've done then, what this assumes is that we've already identified which variables actually are important. There's no point manipulating variables which are not going to affect your why. 
your response. Okay, so in our screening phase and in phase two, where we've done maybe a resolution three design, and then we've moved to a resolution four design in the second phase, we've now actually identified the variables that have a meaningful impact on life. Those are the ones that go ahead and get manipulated in response to this metric when we climb that mountain. Let's assume we're now at the top of that mountain, so we've achieved our optimum in some way. Well, recognize that our processes do not stay stationary. They're always changing on us. So I may achieve the optimum today, but guarantee a month from now, that particular settings of A, B, and C, let's say we've got three variables that affect Y, those three, A, B, and C, will not be the same three settings that will be appropriate a month from now. Our processes will have drifted and changed below us. So we call this then evolutionary operation. So this again is due to George Fox, whose uh, idea this was. Recognize that our process is always moving around. Our heat exchangers are fouling, our reactors have build up in there, our catalysts are deactivating. Um, we're changing the mechanism that we uh, operate our processes with slow bearing disturbances. Many chemical processes adjust their mode of operation from summertime to winter time. So we have to realize that those optimum values we found in the response surface method will not be the ones that guarantee a maximum Y variable later on in time. So what we have to do then is apply evolution operation. Um, some companies do this automatically with their computer-based systems. Many companies do not. So this is a wide open field for you guys when you start working to start investigating and making more money for your, for your companies that you're working for. And it's very, very simple. It almost requires no permission from your boss or manager to do. All you do is you pick your operating point and make very small perturbations around it in a factorial manner. So there's my operating point and I'm dealing with two variables, let's say A and B. Move your process up and down and left and right here in A and B to operate in a factorial manner around your baseline operation. And these moves are incredibly small. These are small enough moves that you do not notice a major impact on your Y variable or Y variable. So the quality of a production at this point is not very different from the quality of the production achieved at any of the other points. But what you do though is that you run replicate designs here for many days. You keep jumping around from point to point and you build up several Y values. So now I've maybe got four or five experiments here. Let's, let's assume we've got five at every point. I'm going to have five times four is 20 data points. And I can estimate the model Y is equal to V naught plus B A X A plus B B X B plus the two factor interaction. So four parameters and four uh, and 20 experimental data points. I've got a high number of degrees of freedom. I can quickly estimate confidence intervals and develop a model for this local region over here. And because, let's assume I'm near the optimum, I may have to also add star points as we discussed last class. So I may need to add axial points as part of my experiment. So I may need to collect a few runs at these points so that I can add quadratic terms to my model. So BAA XA squared plus BBB XB squared. So build a local model of your process and you're going to realize that as you build this model up, and as I said before, many companies do this in an automatic way. They tell their computer systems to automatically make these adjustments in A, B, and C. They randomly go pick one of these points of operations. And the, the computer automatically updates and builds and rebuilds this model over here and finds where the optimum is and then shifts to that. Okay? So the key is multiple experiments. You measure multiple Y values. What you're doing with that is that you're eliminating all the noise. So every time I measure a Y value, there's error in that Y. But if I've got multiple measurements of Y, that error starts to blend away. Then you can move yourself along this operating, uh, sorry, move yourself along that response surface so you can retain the optimum.
Okay, so in the response of this project, there you're climbing the mountains, you're making quite rapid changes in Y. What we're talking about is how do we stay at that at the top of that hill? That we're recognizing that hill is moving on us. That optimum is not staying still. So we always if we stood still where A and B are, a month later, if that's mountain, my heel was originally here, it's now moved over here. So I've actually fallen down the mountain. So what this is doing is we're always making sure we're hunting for this direction to retain the mountain. So what that implies though, is that if you're doing this regularly, the difference in Y values between this point over here and this point over here is relatively small if you're doing this frequently. If you're seeing large changes in Y, it means that the step size is here and you know, too big. So evolutionary operation then is this fourth phase in the process where you figure out what is important up here, then you've optimized, now you try to maintain it. The same thinking is along the lines of process monitoring. Process monitoring, we said, while our process is operating at a desirable point, we're producing good product. How do we monitor our process and we look at Shuar charts and Qsum charts so that we can stick at that optimum? Okay. Same idea here. We first figured out what are the important variables, now we're trying to maintain and monitor that optimum or search for better optimum as our process is showing. And uh, petrochemical companies are good at doing this. They do a lot of these uh, sorts of monitoring systems online and they, they call them, if for any of you go work in the petrochem area, you'll see these systems marketed as RTOs, so real-time optimizers. They, they follow a number of these ideas. Okay, let's talk about one other final important issue with experiments and that's when you make mistakes. If we run an experiment, we say, let's take again the case of two variables, a, B. We've got A over here and B running at this four corner points at the, in the ideal situation. Here's my center point, my baseline, the zero, zero. <coughs> so this point over here corresponds to minus one, minus one. This one corresponds to plus one, minus one. This is plus, plus. And this point over here is minus plus. And I'll add the ones just to emphasize our discussion. Now very often, you go tell the operator to go operate at this particular point. But you don't tell the operator, operator plus one, plus one. That doesn't mean anything to them. So you convert it back over to real world units. Well in real world units, let's say that that corresponds to, uh, let's take this example here for consistency. In the A variable, let's say that that corresponds to 425 Kelvin and 475 at the high level. So let's assume that you told the operator, go operate at 475 Kelvin, but instead of operating at 475, they hear 455, and they go run the experiment over there. So let's take a look. My midpoint, 425, 475, this midpoint corresponds to 450 Kelvin. So they've gone and operated just above this midpoint. What do you do with that? So they've gone and run this experiment over here. Let's assume that they got the other three correct. So now you've got these four data points as such. Well, we can rescue that mistake. We don't throw that data point out. Okay? So what we do is we simply recognize we didn't quite get to the level we needed to in terms of variable A. We ran at 455 Kelvin. So in coded units, that corresponds to 455 minus 450 divided by the half range, which is 475 minus 425. So you ran at a value of plus 0.2. Okay, so what we do then when we construct our X matrix is we have to use this value instead. We don't go use plus one, plus one for that observation because, well, it, it really wasn't plus one, plus one. What we read instead was plus point two for A 
and plus one for B. So my X matrix then, when I set it up in R or in Excel or whichever software you use to build your least squares model, your X matrix then will have a column for B0, will have a column for BA, a column for BB, and a column for the two-factor interaction. So in standard order then you'll have ones for those four observations. The others were done successfully, so that's minus one, plus one, minus one. But then over here, instead of putting plus one, we put a plus point two. BB was done correctly, minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one. The two-factor interaction is the product of these is plus one, minus one, minus one, and then this is plus point two. So that's my x matrix. I'll then have my four y values, and then I can just calculate b, my slope coefficient, is x transpose x inverse, x transpose y is a regular way. The only difference is that now this x matrix will not have the following of columns anymore. So there will be some cross correlation between the columns of x here because we're not quite a following column. But we can still estimate these four slope coefficients, B0, BA, BB, BAB. It's just we won't have the efficiency of the, of the, the, the orthogonal X matrix. By that I mean our variances of A are going to be contaminated with the variances of B because we've lost orthogonality. When we've got orthogonal columns, each, each slope coefficient is independent of the, of the other. But the loss of orthogonality means that we, we have some smearing from one coefficient to the other, but at least we can still recover some information. We don't throw it out entirely. Okay, so we'll often see this as well, not just when operators or yourself make a mistake, we'll often see this if there's a region where we cannot operate due to safety or other concerns. So here in this example, we've got temperature as one variable, concentration as another, I cannot go operate at high concentration and at high temperature, probably for safety reasons. So I would never be able to, even if I wanted, to get my plus one, plus one point. What I can do, however, is place two experiments right at that constraint boundary. Now I've got five data points, four coefficients that I need to estimate. My X matrix will not be quite orthogonal, but at least I'll be able to estimate those slope coefficients to a great up to a very high degree of accuracy. So these are, that's just some final thoughts then on design experiments that are important with the practicalities that you, will, that you will face. So every experiment I've been involved with in the analysis of the data, there's always been a situation where um, this has happened, where we did not quite reach the line of the plus one. And it's usually, just due to keying uh, values into the set points in the process that didn't quite work out, or we put in 400, and let's say we wanted to operate at 475, we put 475 in, but the control system you know, just never quite achieved 475, we achieved maybe 472. So we just used that value instead, converted it over to coded units and calculated X matrix. So practical situations will almost always have your X matrix that doesn't quite work quite as you've seen in the ideal case. Okay, so that wraps it up for design experiment. Yeah. Uh, can you not then redefine your upper and lower bound? Yeah. Good question. So the question is can you then redefine your upper and lower bounds? Um, you can sometimes. <coughs> so let's say the operator ran that experiment first but hadn't run this one yet, then absolutely I can go bring this bound over here and pretend that that was my factorial. Shift my baseline over here somewhere, and then I have a factorial. But if this experiment was run already, then you're out of luck. Right? But that's a, that's a great, great way of thinking about it. Anything else on DOEs? OK, so this thinking here about uh, the coded units and the conversion of two real units was exactly what we were looking at in the last class in response surface methods, which is when we fit these, um, when we created this X matrix over here for the corresponding 
central composite design. So the fact that these points are not quite at the usual level of minus ones and plus ones, so we update our hex matrix to reflect that. Just one other point actually here on central composite designs. I had a question on the nonlinearity of this model. This model is nonlinear in terms of its surface. However, from a least squares perspective, it is a linear model. It is linear in the parameters. The least squares model is only estimating V0, Vt, Vs, Vts, Vtt, and Vss. These are linear. It's nonlinear in this transformation of x. So I'm making a nonlinear transformation of x, but the least squares model doesn't see or care for that. It's linear in the coefficients. If I had a, a VSS cubed or VSS square root or something like that, that's a nonlinear model. But this model is linear in the, in the parameters I'm estimating. Linear in the coefficients. But it's nonlinear in terms of the surface. That's physical. So let's just be clear on where that nonlinearity comes from.